Good morning. Can I welcome everyone to the 13th meeting in 2015 of the Infrastructure and Capital Investment Committee. Everyone present is reminded to switch off any mobile phones as they affect the broadcasting system. As meeting papers are provided in digital format, you may see tablets being used in the course of the meeting. No apologies have been received for this meeting. Uh, agenda item number one is for the committee to continue to take evidence for its piece of work on access to Scotland's major urban railways. Can I welcome Neil Galatley, Head of Transportation at Dundee City Council, Councillor Leslie Hines, Convener of Transport and Environment Committee at the City of Edinburgh Council, and Bruce Kilo, Head of Policy and Planning at Strathclyde Partnership for Transport. And Adam Ingram is going to kick off our questions this morning. Thank you very much, Convener. Now, uh, and good morning, everyone. Uh, the committee heard evidence at its last meeting that there seems to be little joint working between local authorities, network, rail and transport providers, which leads to poor transport integration with, and again limiting the accessibility of major railway stations. Do you share these views and if so, how might they be addressed? Who wants to kick off? Yeah. Um, well, this is a matter that's uh, concerned me since I first became Convener of Transport Environment um, over three years ago. Um, and my concern was particularly regarding the access in and out of the station, but also the situation you've had evidence of regarding the um, surrounding station. But interestingly, I was just looking back some of my files. It's quite useful to keep files sometimes. But it actually goes back to, um, I had a briefing in December of 2012 when it was being suggested that we would be taking um, vehicles out of Waverley Station. If people know, it's particularly Waverley Station, we've got concern about Haymarket. Is, there are some concerns there, but particularly Waverley station and there was a, a, a working group set up in March 2009 between Network Rail, the Department of Transport, British Transport Police and the City of Edinburgh Council and that was looking particularly at the security issues but also the refurbishment that was coming um, along with that and I think one of the, the frustrations I think the officers and myself feel is that there has been these working groups, there has been the, uh, working together but then the goalposts keep on changing and network rail tend to make decisions um, you know, without um, going back to that working group. And I could just give you the example of the, the access to, to the, the, the Waverley station. In term right. the specific stations, yeah. so it's really just um, some... Yeah. Um, it was just to give an example in terms of you know, the working group was meeting, discussing the issues. Um, uh, one part we were told, um, it was announced in the press, that all vehicles were coming out of, this, out of the station uh, within, a, I think, a few weeks. I had a meeting with Network Rail. They said they would change it, they would put it taxis, but would control it, spent quite a lot of money at the control mechanism. Then there was an accident, an unfortunate death of a pedestrian on Waverley Bridge. And again, within a few weeks, and the press notice came to us at the same time um, to say that they were then going to take all vehicles out um, of, of the station. So all I'm saying is there are mechanisms and there has been a working between the officers, particularly a network rail. But it appears that network rail make decisions on, on their own rather than coming and, and having some consensus and discussion okay. um, with the council. That, that's very helpful, but we would like to explore that in more detail okay. in the course of our, our session. Okay. Um, okay. Um, well, essentially we're saying there is a problem with joint working. Would you agree with that, Mr. Kilo? I think there's, there's, good, there's good and bad. I think it, you, you really have to look at the, the range of roles and responsibilities of the different organisations that can be involved in a transport project. The example I know we'll probably come on to later on is, is Glasgow Queen Street for us, which is uh, one of Scotland's major rail stations, and the number of partners that are involved, not just in terms of the station, but also the surrounding developments around Queen Street, which are happening all at the one time. You've got Buchanan Galleries redevelopment, you've got uh, SPT doing the Buchanan Street subway station re refurb, you've got the station going on, you've got various other things going on, so there can be quite a range of different organisations and from our point of view um, we, we've tried to kind of lead the way in that the, the Queen Street development in terms of ensuring that planning 
programming and the delivery of the end product are all coordinated and we've done that through the Queen Street Passenger Forum as we call it which has got all those bodies plus organisations like Transport Focus uh, and the Glasgow Access Panel on it now because there are a whole range of concerns about how those things would dovetail together. So that to us is a positive step forward, but our experience previously has been that, that delivering major projects uh, uh, on the rail network uh, can be challenging uh, and can take time. Um, we, we, we did one over the last few years. We were part of a group who did Dalmarnock Station in the east end of Glasgow for regeneration purposes and for the Commonwealth Games. And one of the most important things that we thought to get right at the very beginning of that was to think through who had ownership of the project, who was going to be involved, make that clear from the outset and I think that that did well for that project. So I think there can be good and bad. I think the important thing is to get uh, who your stakeholders are, who your clients are going to be, make sure the right people are around the table, the right, the right officers or, or, or elected members around the table and make sure that there's, there's a clear commitment to do things in a joint uh, working manner. So are you suggesting it's a uh it's the role of the Regional Transport Authority to, to do this? Uh, I would say it depends on the scale of the project. I think from the, the Queen Street point of view, which is the live one that we're involved in at the moment, um, you know, when we saw what else was happening, I, I suppose just to take a step back, we were always particularly um, concerned in how this would impact on the customer, the passenger, whatever you would want to call it, so that they had minimum fuss, minimum disruption to their travel patterns and I think that's why when we had discussions with Transport Scotland, Network Rail and others we said listen we need to make sure that we're all coordinated in this we don't want you know us doing something in the subway major work uh, at the same time as you're doing something in, on Queen Street Station or Buchanan Galleries are doing something we want to make sure that we can as best as we can try and coordinate that so there is a role most certainly for, for an organisation like SPT but I think it would really depend on the scale of the project. Okay, Mr. Galatley, would you want to comment? Thank you. Um, yes, it's a very challenging um, interface you, you enter when you're undertaking station redevelopment or re refurbishment. And it plays such a major role in your city's function that um, the City Council in Dundee has taken a lead role almost in um, creating a new station facility in Dundee. We've probably spent the best part of a decade, 15 years working with the rail industry, operating and infrastructure side of it to, to seek a new and better facility because uh, we are lobbied regularly by local council, uh, co colleagues in local councils round about, our access forums, public transport users to improve the facilities and, and, and they were, as I mentioned in my statement, they were deemed fit for purpose so we would not prioritise investment. So we've had to take a lead in terms of design architect appointments and it also very fortuitously lands right in a major regeneration process in the city of Dundee that is led by the department I work for called the city development department so that brings in land use planning, transport planning, engineering and other design parts of urban design. So yes it, has, it does present challenges but we're used to working in multi-agency groups and on this, on this occasion the city of Dundee decided that that was a priority for our city and we've taken a lead um, I don't necessarily say it's difficult to show how a priority in a city is a priority for the National Rail Infrastructure Company. That's a challenge to, to sit it alongside other national priorities. But we have received technical assistance, but we do pay for that. It's not given free. You know, we pay for that sort of service as we, as we move forward. We pay for the engineering and technical support we get from the rail industry as we move forward. So the kind of problems that Councillor Hines was outlining with regards to Edinburgh with Network Rail, your relationship with Network Rail, how, how did you uh, sort that? Um, a lot of hard work with senior officer time, building relationships, and of course the danger is some individuals move on and you, you start again. So that's part of the time process is um, building up an understanding, um, going through official uh, appraisal processes, um, and an investment a lot of time and a lot of money with specialist support. I mean, as a local government officer, I don't necessarily have the skills to deal with the real industry specialisms and I'm reliant on their advice, but you have to engage the right advisors and experts to make sure that you are pushing forward with the right project because otherwise you could waste a lot of time and money going down the wrong, wrong track. Okay. Um, 
So do you think there is a role here for, for Transport Scotland to actually set down a, a protocol or a methodology um, and to facilitate um, joint working, uh, given that Transport Scotland are the main funders of uh, both ScotRail and Network Rail Scotland? I think, um, again, as I said earlier, I think it really depends on the scale of the project. I know, for example, and I think it's most certainly a positive step forward, is the new Network Rail Scott Rail Joint Alliance, um, which has come about as part of the, the new franchise, and, and we'll wait and see how that works. But I think that's most certainly a positive step forward for, uh, for organisations you know, like councils who are looking to engage with the rail industry. Perhaps they've got you know, a single point of contact um, there. I think there is most certainly a role for Transport Scotland in, in ensuring coordination at, at national level where it's a significant scale project. Um, we do that for, for projects which you could describe as regional scale. You'll be aware perhaps of the Fastlink uh, bus system which we are putting in Glasgow, just launched to the, the New South Glasgow Hospital. And that was us working with Glasgow City Council and that, was, that, that worked on a uh, Transport Scotland. We weren't too involved in that, although they were obviously funding it. So I think that um, there is most certainly a role for Transport Scotland on national scale projects uh, and on others, it would be an organisation like SPT or indeed a council who could perhaps uh, uh, take the lead in coordinating that. I think again, it really depends on, on the project. There are all, many transport projects are so different. Um, Formalising it may actually create more bureaucracy and more difficulty. Um, I think it has to be looked at a, a project uh, level scale. But, um, it perhaps would be good to have some sort of formal commitment from any organisation like Network Rail, Scott Rail, ourselves, councils, whoever, at the beginnings of projects to say, yes, we will engage with you, uh, we will set up a project uh, steering group, uh, we're committed to sharing information. Uh, that's sometimes a difficulty if the organisation is a commercial organisation, um, but that's something that I think is, in the, you know, as, as I said earlier, in the passenger's interest to make sure things are coordinated through the planning, development and delivery uh, process. Okay, but the, sorry, Councillor Hines. I was just going to say as well is that while I agree that um, each project is quite different, there's come small projects and some very large projects and, and how do you do a protocol for that and who should take the lead. I mean, I think we were working well together, but I think it's more about the decision-making process as well and about network rail. What is their decision-making process? And, uh, and you can have all the working groups you like and all the good relationships you like, but if then the network rail decide, well, that's what we're going to do, uh, and then the effects has on you as a local authority and on the passengers, um, the fact that's a difficulty and I think one of the hopefully questions you might want to ask is you know the power of network rail um, and governance and responsibility decision making process and one of the other issues as well which may will come up later on is also about permitted planning development rights as well um, you know where we you know where we don't have a situation where we can ask for, for example for section 75 to help but also they, they can do whatever they like almost under the planning legislation uh, and I think that is a challenge we've got that challenge out at the airport as well so I think it's another issue that I'm not sure if the other authorities find that as well but um, that might be something else to look at but in summary I think you need to look each project um, and the large projects we need to have some protocol but the decision making process of network rail and how they make decisions I think has to be done in partnership and it really isn't they ultimately make the decision and we can influence them all we like but they make the decision well, Would you like to answer your own question about uh, what you do about network rail then? <laughs> well I think you need to look at the, maybe it's at the um, I don't know, at government level to have discussions with Network Rail and presumably with Westminster Scottish Parliament government to look at where the responsibilities lie because I don't know about you but I'm quite confused about exactly um, I know they've changed recently but um, where the decision making lie does it lie here in Scotland, does it lie in Westminster, does it lie at a local level because when I wrote to Network Rail following our meeting that um, uh, Mr Eady was at um, with um, users etc um, I then just got a letter back saying well get in touch with your Scottish person well we've done that and we've had the meetings so it's a kind of perhaps just clarifying exactly network rails governance and responsibility because at the end of the day network rail is publicly owned okay anything to add Mr Gillatley 
Yeah, I would just see um, rail is such a significant form of transport. It certainly is not a local transport form. It's local and is at the very least a regional transport form. And, and I think Transport Scotland and the regional transport partnerships, as well as the local government, at local authority level, need that support possibly from Transport Scotland in terms of certainly a guidance at the very outset of a major project inception to make sure that we don't that we do follow the correct routes. And, uh, and, and that really would be a helping hand to assist us and support us. Not all authorities have the, the engineering or, con or, or design or consultancy skills or, or volume of staff to be able to handle this sort of project. And I think that guidance would help. It would help the decision makers as well locally decide this is really is a priority. How do we push for this? I, I think Councillor Hines touched on it. How, who, do you who do you push to for uh, um, additional support beyond your own local wishes? Because it does fit in with a national and a regional agenda as well as what's happening in your local urban area. So would uh, both of the gentlemen here, would you agree that there is an issue with regards to network rail and the decision making process? Yes, I think there is. And I think it's, it's probably, just, just echoing what Councillor Hines said, I think it's a lot to do with transparency. Um, we as SPT, like, the, like Neil and, and Dundee, we are democratically accountable organisations. We report to our partnership board every decision of a, a major scale which we make is reported and is available publicly on our website and members of the public are welcome to come along to, to our board. Meetings. I think it's perhaps um, there, there is a level of uh, confusion over the transparency of network rail in terms of their governance arrangements. I'm not sure particularly that too many people are aware that they are you know, controlled at UK level um, and that even though it's Network Rail Scotland. Having said all that, I think the, there is um, issues to do with the, the, the legislation that's in place. For example, at Queen Street Station, um, Network Rail were taking forward the Queen Street redevelopment through the transport and works uh, process which meant that there was the, what they call the red line round the station and that was really where they were restricted to looking at their development within that red line round the station. Obviously our concern is how that integrates with the rest of the transport network, the bus stops which are three, four yards outside that red line, what happens there, pick up, drop off, uh, blue badge parking, uh, all those sort of things, integration with the cycle network, there's all cycle hubs and stuff like that planned for the, for the new station. So whether they're a victim of that as well, that perhaps needs looked at. Although I'm aware uh, the Transport Minister has said as part of the National Transport Strategy refresh, he will be looking at roles and responsibilities of the various organisations. So perhaps there's an opportunity to clarify uh, some of the decision-making processes and governance arrangements with Network Rail and their roles and responsibilities through that process. That's, that's perhaps something to consider. Yeah. Um, can I also say I think there, there is a great opportunity during 2015 uh, with this new deep alliance between Network Rail and the Bellio Scott Rail. Um, we're really looking forward to working with the Bellio. With uh, they've got some great vision in their in their their franchise offer that they'll wish to bring forward over and above the straight running of the trains, and um, I would like to see that develop over the next uh, three to six months as they establish their new way of working and I think that they, they have already indicated that working more closely with network rail is key to giving us a successful rail based public transport system. So just wanted to relate that operator side is so important to network rail that the majority of the stations are actually managed by Scott Rail as opposed to network rail in Scotland. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I think the committee will very much um, want to explore with Network Rail when we have them before the committee the issues that you, Councillor Hines and Mr Kilo, have highlighted this morning in terms of the lack of transparency around the governance arrangements and decision making processes um, that Network Rail uh, adhere to. But I wonder if I could just explore with Councillor Hines um, the specific issues around Waverley Station. You, you say in your evidence, your written evidence to the committee, that both Haymarket and Waverley have been the subject of major improvement, providing additional capacity and passenger facilities, but the recent improvements did not address wider accessibility issues. And that's certainly something that has been echoed by the evidence we've received from other stakeholders, so that um, the oral evidence we've received from Sustran, Cycling Scotland, Scottish Taxi Federation and CPT 
indicated that Network Rail did not consult on the closure of the vehicle access ramps before deciding to do so. Just for the record, can I ask you what um, level of consultation and discussion there was between Network Rail and the City of Edinburgh Council prior to that decision to close the vehicle access ramps on Waverley Bridge was? If we go back, because I, I, I think it's quite important, because there was, there was um, originally when the refurbishment, but it was also linked to the, the, the issue of um, security, um, and particularly coming from um, the Westminster government in terms of security, and also linked to, to Glasgow Airport, etc. So there was these mechanisms to be put in, and, and some of that went alongside their refurbishment. And the discussion that the officers had was um, their concern about access and vehicle access in, because anyone who knew what it was like before is you could go in in a vehicle, you could drop off, you could pick up, and you could get a taxi there. Um, and, and that also for people with disabilities, for people who were needing support and help could do that. Um, they then decided, um, and I'm, I'm not sure exactly the dates, but they decided at one time to then say all vehicles were to come out. And the council and myself um, lobbied um, Network Rail to say we thought this was, was not the right way to go and um, just to make that decision, take all the vehicles out and what the consequence would be for the passengers, but also the consequence for the surrounding area um, surrounding Waverley. But I, as has been said uh, by Bruce, it's one of the issues, that the constraints they have is this red line that appears to be around. I think it's maybe something you might want to do further. So we lobbied them and they then decided we had a meeting down in Waverley Station and they decided they would agree to have access for taxis who were registered and also access for people like handicaps etc to be able to get access and they spent quite a lot of money I think almost half a million to put in barriers and a control mechanism which appeared to continue to break down as well I have to say and that's what happened so you know we weren't particularly happy but we did a consultation the taxi trade etc and that so they weren't particularly happy either because you needed to pay to get access in but at least it was giving the passenger an opportunity to be able to get a taxi service in the station and then consultation between the city there was a, a consultation in yeah. terms of they decided mm -hmm. they would take everything out all vehicles mm -hmm. out everything including taxis and because we lobbied them they then decided to be fair to them they then decided to have a controlled taxi um, mechanism and for people with disabilities in terms you'd have to register like handicaps etc you'd have to register and um, that kind of didn't work because as I say the barriers kept on not working and there was a bit of a problem with that and then when there was the fatality um, just outside the station um, um, I think a few weeks after that um, I got a, we got the press release at the same time they announced they were closing I think the next week or the week after so there was no consultation at all with right. us in terms of taking all taxis um, out of the station. Okay, but that's the clarification I was seeking. Yeah. So thank you very much uh, for that. Um, and you, so, so the City of Edinburgh Council learns about the decision to remove vehicles from the station at the same time as the press. Correct. And the reasons that were given by Network Rail for the closure of the vehicle access ramps, you alluded to the issue around security. Did they actually write subsequent to that decision being announced to the press to explain what the reasons were? Not as far as I'm aware. Okay. I mean, not to me anyway, and uh, I think I've had at least three meetings with them and also met them down on site as well on a number, a couple of occasions. So I've, I don't remember getting anything from them um, following on from that. They'd made that decision and they implemented that decision. And at the meetings, what was the explanation from Network Rail as to why they'd closed the vehicle access ramps? Previously, um, we've not um, we've not had any other meetings with them following that. It's been more officers because, mm -hmm. to be honest, I felt as if I was going to meetings, we'd get agreement, we'd go away, and then it wouldn't be implemented. And one of the frustrations as well is we'd sit at the meetings, we'd agree a certain process, we'd want to then put out a joint press release which would say we're agreeing to this access, we're agreeing to better signage, better um, advertising on websites, etc. And we're agreeing all of that. And I think on two occasions, we we agreed all of that, and we said we put out a joint press release to let the public know the action we're taking together and on two occasions we couldn't get agreement from Network Rail um, to put the press release out so it's kind of frustrating from us we went to meetings we seemed to get agreement we go away and then that agreement then didn't kind of happen some of the things did happen for example um, signposting within the station has improved I don't think it's still good enough but it has improved so some of the things did happen but we didn't follow it wasn't followed through mm -hmm. and 
as a public body funded by the taxpayer, does it concern you that Network Rail are behaving in that way? Yes, I think as I said to the previous answer, I think the previous sorry question that my concern is is the, the accountability and that you know if we're working in partnership and we appear to get agreement round the table or way forward and particularly when all taxis were taken out um, of the station, the consequences for the surrounding areas but also for passengers. Um, where do you get pick up a taxi? You know, where do you access them? Um, we had to then deal with um, over a very short period of time in, in a kind of emergency situation. So one of the concerns that the Council has presumably is that decisions are being taken by Network Rail that you haven't been consulted no. on, um, but you're having to then live with the consequences of those decisions in terms of having to alleviate the impact of them on passengers. Yes, uh, and particularly um, on Waverley Bridge um, and on Market Street, we did have plans along with working with Network Rail to imp put improvements, which you spent around about a million pounds on improvements and they're just about finishing. There's still bits and pieces to be done and one of the things we've also had to do because of the consequences of all taxis coming out is to change the taxi rank um, in Market Street. We're about to change that and we're about to lose income in terms of um, high parking charges that are in that area and are well used and we're having to put the taxi rank out there and that's a lot of income to us as a council um, because we want to try to provide the best service possible so um, as consequences of their decision to take taxis out we've had to then readjust our taxi stances in Market Street and also look at Colton Road as well and whether we can improve it there and then there's also add-on difficulties outside um, the, you know, um, out at Princess Street as well where you've got double taxis parking and all those kind of problems so all the vehicles it was like well we'll take all the taxis out and it's your problem um, and no, no kind of consequences of what that would mean for us. Are there any other measures that the council have had to take to alleviate um, the consequences of closing uh, the vehicle access ramps? That you haven't mentioned well, so far. well, the other issue is obviously to do with access, and um, I don't know if you want to talk about the ramps, etc. But it seems to me pretty ludicrous. We've got two ramps, a north and a south ramp, where you've got a narrow entrance in both ramps with this large bit of road that is never ever used, apart from delivery vehicles. And it always seems peculiar to me and to people out in the outside world that we're somehow about security that delivery vehicles can go into the station, and is that not a security risk? Um, but um, taxis can't who are, who are all checked out so that we've got two ramps um, and access in which is the main access in from Waverley Bridge which has got a very narrow you'll see the photographs in, in the submission there's a very narrow uh, place for people to either uh, pedestrians buggies and um, uh, cyclists who have to sit mount and then push their bikes down that and you can imagine the kind of consequences of that so you've got the north ramp and then at the bottom of the north ramp you've got this pretty tacky looking um, sort of um, I don't know what you call fencing we spent, you know, so we've spent millions of pounds upgrading uh, Waverley Station and you've got this temporary pretty crappy looking um, thing at the bottom um, within your station and what we were trying to encourage uh, Network Rail to do and uh, with the station um, person charged with the station was to say well even if you were to have the delivery access on one of the ramps but to open up the other ramp um, for pedestrians and cyclists that would at least be a more welcoming I mean, we're talking about you know millions of people use the station in terms of pedestrians, cyclists um, um, coming in and out, and people using public transport, and also its visitors to the city. Um, and we have made improvements in, in, in Waverley Bridge, which makes it easy for pedestrians um, and for public transport, um, and on Market Street. And those are the consequences of that. But I really would hope for you might give them some pressure when they come next week. I think to say about those ramps. It's just ludicrous that we now on, have that. Just on, on the ramps, we've obviously heard evidence from a range of uh, stakeholders and one of the suggestions was that the, the, the vehicle access ramp be reopened for cyclists and that we increase the space available for pedestrians on the ramps. Is that something that you would support? Yeah, and one of the issues that, to, to be fair to Network Rail as well, Waverley they've looked at, is, is having all of the deliveries coming into Colton Road, and I think that would be one of the developments. I'm not sure what timescale that is, but we would, you know, we would prefer there was no deliveries at all. If you're going to take all vehicles out, why do you, do you not take delivery vehicles out as well? Um, and they could go down to Colton Road, and all deliveries could go in there, and therefore you'd be able to open up both ramps, which could be accessible for pedestrians and cyclists, and perhaps you could make one of them um, cyclist access only. And, and could you do that at the same time as um, creating a, a taxi rank on Carlton Road as you'd mentioned previously? 
Yes, there's a, there is one there at the moment, which is in a temporary basis, but one of the issues is that most people don't know it's there, and that's one of the other issues that we've discussed with Network Rail and with the station. How do you publicise it? How do you promote where the taxis are? I know my daughter lives in Glasgow, and when I'm dropping her off at the station, I actually lose the Colton Road um, e um, entrance because it's an exit, because it's a really good place to drop off. Maybe the more people that know that, maybe it won't be as good. But I think we need to publicise, we need to promote, and we're certainly putting new signage up in the surrounding area to let people know. And for example, there is, and most people don't know this as well, and it's about how you promote it, you can go into... Um, the station um, car park and you can have half an hour free parking which will take you right up to the um, up through the new street car park and you can actually have that but most people don't know that's available as well you know say you've got an elderly parent you want to drop off and is happy to go up in the lift but most of that isn't publicised and that's one of the things we keep saying to network rail but also to obviously waverley station how do you promote all of the exits all of the entrances um, to it rather than just Market Street or rather just um, Waverley. Um, but Colton Road, I think, is, you know, and with the development of um, St James's Quarter as well, there's an opportunity to enhance that area um, linking down into Leith. Okay, thank you. David, do you have some questions? Um, and thank you, Convener. Um, Councillor Hines, you probably watched the evidence that we took uh, last week uh, about this very same subject. What certainly I was picking up was a slightly different version of uh, events about the reasons for banning uh, vehicles going into Waverley and particularly for the taxis to be uh, removed. And that was that Network Rail received uh, security advice that stations that were effectively underground should have taxis removed and apart from deliveries should be removing cars. And obviously in the Parliament we're fairly used to security advice. Mm. That, uh, first of all, you won't get the detail, but it's reasonable to know that advice was given. <clears throat> and that would normally come from Police Scotland, Security Services, and the sort of National Centre for Infrastructure, which gives advice uh, to public bodies. If that was true, that would put a different version of events. In other words, Network Rail were merely following security advice. They may not tell you that, but I can understand that's a version of events. Uh, does that strike a chord with you at all? Yeah, I mean, it does. As I said, I think <coughs> previously it was security, but also it was refurbishment happened at, at the same time. And yes, that was the reason. And, and to be fair, again, to Network Rail, when the discussions we had with them, they were saying, this is advice we've been given. Uh, and, and some of the things like at um, Colton Road, where you've got steps there, there's a large, huge bollards that are there. Um, and they, that's part of the security. So, yes, you're, to be fair to them, in that their advice was being given was about security, uh, uh, but also, at the same time, was a refurbishment of the station at the same time. Having said that, I mean, obviously we will have evidence uh, session with them and we can put these points specifically to them. I would have thought if they'd been given security advice, even though they might not reveal the detail to you, they might well say as a public body, well, we've had security advice, we have to do it because of this. Presumably you would have understood that and it would make the decision making a little bit easier. But at no time did they ever make that clear to you? Well, they did make it clear that the, the security advice they would be given was that, that, that their advice was that they should be considering um, the issue of having vehicles, as I understand, under, under anything under the station. But I suppose my question is, if that security means taxis and vehicles, why do we still have delivery vehicles that come into the station? And I think the public would then question that. And you're right that, you know, if they've been given security advice, and that, to be fair to them, was what they said to us. They said, you know, is security advice we're being given? But I think the difficulty was, if the security advice was taking all vehicles out, and they haven't, and then they said, well, we'll put taxis in, well, my question is, why did they say take all vehicles out? Then they said, we'll only put taxis in, and then they took all vehicles out. So it hasn't been very consistent. And obviously it's been more difficult for passengers, because clearly passengers who use you know, Queen Street have taxis adjacent to the station, which is very convenient. And we've taken evidence, as you know, from passengers that have sight difficulties, uh, physical difficulties. It is much more difficult when you arrive at the station now to access taxis. And you mentioned yourself there's issues of signage. Uh, the, can I just take you on to the issue around Carlton Road, which the convener has cruelly taken my question. But nevertheless, I, um, the issue around Carlton Road is, a, is an, an, is an interesting one. Um, what, what, is, what is the council's position on the creation of a taxi at Carlton Road? I understand that would depend on a remodelling of the junction at Leith Street. I mean, do you have a council policy around the creation of a taxi rack at this area and the knock-on effect for road redesigning? 
we would um, like to look at the taxi rank in Colton Road, and we had I had discussions with the taxi trade with the officers about um, Market Street, Waverley Station, Waverley Bridge, sorry, and Colton Road. And but part of the difficulty is is the taxi drivers, the taxi owners are not that keen on the Colton Road because they feel it's not a well used one, and because the signage within the station, you wouldn't be encouraged to go there. Um, but I think with better signage, etc., then there would be more people who perhaps are wanting to go a certain distance. And also, if you're then going to in Lee Street, it's going to be developed as part of St James's Quarter. There seems to be an opportunity there. And if you've travelled up that part, up to, up to Lee Street, for a pedestrian, it's pretty appalling. You've got very, very narrow, narrow um, pavements. Um, but what we did put in, we put in a, a, a funding bid into the stations fund. Um, to improve that whole area in terms for taxis, pedestrians, cyclists and access to that. But unfortunately we were um, unsuccessful in getting funding. That would be kind of match funding. We were looking for funding for station improvement. And I don't know if that's something you might want to talk about as well. I'd be quite keen to talk about that because there's 30 odd million sitting um, and some of it's been used but a lot of it hasn't and we weren't successful. But yes, I would, be, I would welcome the opportunity and you know, obviously depend on resources but we would look to hop, put some of our resources in if we could get some match funding and some help and support to improve it for taxi rank at the Colton Road end. Well, that's good to hear, and it's good you're mentioning as well you've got, you would want facilities for cyclists because I think that's uh, crucially important. But presumably if the signage was changed so that it was clear that there was going to be a drop-off point there uh, within the station, taxi drivers would be keener to use that facility. Um, you'd think so, um, but the <laughs> discussions that I had huh. with them was that, um, you know, I think you had Tony Kim here last, last week and, and one of the issues, you know, we've, I've had discussions with him and um, it's, it's persuading people that, that you've got the footfall and you would have the demand for it and it's kind of chicken and egg. Until you've got the taxis there and the facilities there, then people aren't going to come and use it. Um, and it's trying to persuade the taxi driver to have better signage because it would make sense, particularly depending on where you come into the station, um, it would make, actually be quicker to go out there and get a taxi but then it depends on where you're going because of the issue of Leith Street and you can only turn left at the end of Colton Road you can't turn right down to Leith so there's a wee bit of complication there but as I say it's an opportunity I would have thought with the St James's Quarter and the changes they're going to make in terms of Leith Street to try and do the improvements into Colton Road for, for all of those the passengers um, would be an opportunity. You mentioned the issue of funding. You were disappointed that the councils turned down for, for funding. What improvements would you like to see in the funding that's available for local authorities to do improvements like the, like the ones you mentioned? Well, the station fund is still not all allocated, as I understand it, uh, and you might want to question who makes those decisions as well, because as I understand it, it's Scottish Government funding, but it's used through a mechanism with Network Rail. Um, and it's Network Rail, uh, Transport Scotland and the operators, the train operators who make that decision. And one of the, uh, um, I suppose, the constraints they have, as I understand it, is that red line thing, again, in terms it's supposed to be for station users and for rail users. Now, if you look at some of the statistics we sent in a written evidence, you know, um, in the Halcrow study we did, it shows a, a large percentage of people who are in Waverley Bridge and Market Street and Colton Road are using the station. And also, particularly, we were looking for improvements at the top of the, the Waverley escalator um, and for people waiting for buses and the links to buses. If anyone stood there, which I have, it's not the most uh, best experience. Um, we, that was part of our bid to improve that facility so you'd have a, a good interchange between coming out the station escalators and the buses and also tram as well so you'd have that kind of good combination so I would quite like to question and I have questioned the decision making of that because we were told we couldn't be successful for funding even though in my view it was a good application for improvement for rail users because it wasn't exclusively rail users then we couldn't then get that funding and I think that is a real frustration. Yeah I mean I, I, I met as I'm sure other members did um, so it's got shed and network rail and certainly you mentioned these ring fence funds that were available it seems to be back to this sort of cliche about if you're inside the red line or outside it uh, but it seems a very strange argument that a taxi rank next to a major Scottish station is not going to be exclusively used by rail passengers and it's the old issue about integration between other modes of transport but I suspect that will take me on to another, another theme but uh, thank you for your questions and put you back to the convener. Okay. Uh, thank you. Councillor Hines would you be able to uh, ask your officials to share some information with the committee on the bid that uh, City Member Council has made to the, yeah. the station fund. Yeah, do you want that now or do you want that no, later no, on? If, if you want to, uh, 
to place any further comments on the record, I'm happy for you to do that now, but okay. equally happy for your officials to write to the committee. Okay. Well, I'm, I, we can send you the full detail of the submission that we put in, and the, the, we were success. Uh, there is some funding, for example, for cycle racks, and that's again in Haymarket, where the design of Haymarket was a permitted planning development. Um, and again, the, the surrounding area of Haymarket, where if anyone's tried to park your bike there, it's almost impossible. Now, we have got funding, but that's after it's been refurbished. And it seems to me, why did we not think about that and put it at the same time? So, but the station's fund, as I understand it, is still underspent and it needs to be looked at. And if it's Scottish Government funding, then surely, as elected members, you should be asking the Scottish Government, why is it that we cannot spend that funding out with um, the railway stations when it's a benefit for rail users? Uh, and I really do question that. And I'm happy to send all the detailed information. It was an application for Haymarket. They've considered that we could, they may well fund the bridge that would take you over to Dalry Road, but it would cost us as a council nearly 200,000 just to build that up and to design and, uh, and design and uh, costs, etc. And the difficulty with that is you don't want to spend that money then not to be successful. And again, that's maybe something you might want to say about the Scottish Stations Fund, and I'm not sure if you would agree with that as well, that, that if there was even some money there to let um, a local authorities um, build up design work um, to build it up so they could then put in an application with more detailed designs, that would be helpful as well. For some sum of money which happens in some funds, you know, almost it, you get like a wee bit like a lottery, you get some money to help you up to a certain stage. It would be useful if we could look at that. But I think the stations fund is there, sitting there with money, and we in Edinburgh would like to make more improvements, particularly in Colton Road, Haymarket, and at Waverley, um, you know, at the marketplace where the, the buses are. Um, and our bid was unsuccessful. And if we could resubmit it and be more successful, I would welcome that from the committee if they could influence that. Okay, David. Just an observation around the question, Councillor Hines, that I think that's a very good point. If my memory serves me correct, I think the, the big lottery had provision that you could apply to, uh, you know, we would have funding for applications and on a much larger scale, it's probably not a very good analogy, um, on the fourth crossing um, applications that the unsuccessful con consortia, uh, I think, received £5 million as un unsuccessful bidder premium. So there is a sort of uh, uh, track record where that there is facilities and various other grants that you can, you can make an application even though you're unsuccessful and get funding for that. So I think that's a very good point. The gentleman have a comment on the station <laughs> fund specifically. Mr. Convener. Um, the, in the former um, public transport fund days, when the former Scottish executive, there was a preparation fund for public transport uh, major projects to allow you to to the scale of the project that Councillor Hines refer, refers to of, say, 200000 300000 pounds so that you could get the technical advice with, with partners to put in a signed bid um, to take away an element of risk in that sort of a uh, pump prime seed corn type funding. I also wanted to mention as well that the development control side is very interesting stations with, with permitted development almost allowing them to do what, what they need to do um, normally, if you were to do, reconfigure a road layout, say Calton Road or Leith Street they're talking about here, um, that would be incorporated in the transport statement or a transport assessment with a planning application. So you do lose that element of um, city to rail station planning gain. So that is a very valid point. The, um, the, the anything beyond the doors of the station is the city's or the local authority's responsibility. Thank and you. That, that can be costly or make for a very ugly interface between shiny brand new and what's left behind. Thank, Thank you. you. Yeah, just to, to echo some of the points that have been made, I think it's, it's probably important to remember that, that, that rail users will be bus users, will be taxi users, will often be cycle users. People aren't dedicated to, to one mode. And I think that when the, the general public see that, that organisations like ourselves or within the industry can't get integration right. They, they do quite rightly, in my view, uh, question that. And I think that's the, the, the kind of view that we take you know, as, a, as a regional transport authority uh, with multimodal responsibilities. We do try to look across the board. example, at Queen Street, where we have had concerns about the cycling, we've had concerns about pick-up, drop-off, taxis, blue badge parking, the interstation bus between Glasgow Central, Queen Street and others. And I think it is important to, 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 to remember the integration point of view. In terms of the Scottish Stations Fund, absolutely, I think it's there's 
challenges in funding what can be quite eye-watering uh, amounts of money to get projects to uh, through feasibility stages, etc. And that can be a challenge for, for organisations, whether it's local authorities or, or others, to try and uh, pull that money together. Uh, I think there's, there's probably opportunities for looking at that. Um, I think the one thing is that, 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 that challenges organisations um, is looking, you know, but we need to follow what, what they call the Scottish Transport Appraisal Guidance process, the STAG process set by Transport Scotland, and that's something, again, that, that does cost money to do. Uh, we as an organisation have funded uh, works like that before, feasibility, development work. It can be expensive. Um, and, but uh, the main thing for us is you get the right answer at the end of it uh, and you're, you're not spending significant amounts of money going down one route only to be told uh, later on that you didn't follow the stag process for example and so uh, it perhaps would get thrown out so I think that's something that again uh, perhaps clarification is required and again um, uh, if any other funding is available for that then it would most certainly be welcomed convener. Thank you Mike Thank you. Convener, um, I just want to go back to the Waverley situation um, that, that uh, uh, David Stewart was talking about and because the alternative um, hypothesis that I'd heard and perhaps it's only a rumour is that one of the reasons at least for moving the taxis out of the station was to do with air quality um, and that may or may not be the case. I'd be interested to hear from Councillor uh, Hines, if that was mentioned as one of the reasons, but and going beyond that, though, it strikes me that you know uh, there are several issues actually wrapped up in this. We could argue about the decisions that Network Rail have taken or not taken. We could argue about the lack, you know, of consultation, and then we could talk about the time uh, when they informed you. Uh, Edinburgh City Council about the fact that they were taking those design decisions um, and how early on in the process they did inform you that would enable you to do the ancillary work that was within your jurisdiction. Because I think um, irrespective of this red line, and I can accept the concept that beyond the red line they may have no jurisdiction, what I don't, uh, what I'm struggling to accept is that um, that they can't think beyond the red line and consult beyond the red line to allow you to do ancillary work that complements what they're doing. And then in terms of the construction sequence of any works, to be able to minimise the overall impact of construction of both the main station work and the ancillary work. So would you like to maybe just comment and perhaps clarify the situation with regard to these issues that I've touched on? Okay. I mean, as I said right at the beginning, there was a, a project group. So within that project group, within the council and council officials, and particularly the ones that are on the ground in terms of planning and delivering uh, Waverley Bridge, etc., um, and Market Street, then there was that working group that met to discuss how we could make sure that what we did out with that red line and what they did within the red line um, was, that, um, we, was that liaison there. So that liaison was there. It then was because of um, delays um, in the project as well in Waverley Station, which was delayed, um, and also trying to, uh, as an authority, fit in and do those changes in Waverley Bridge and Market Street uh, in terms of um, finding a time that you could slot in those improvements as well. It's quite complex because you've got the festival where you not, can't do anything. I hate to mention it, but since I'm in the transport meeting, um, tram as well and the consequences of that and the disruption over the number of, uh, number of years. So that should be able to facilitate making the changes in Waverley Bridge and, um, and in Market Street in particular, was trying to find the funding for that because there was an indication given as part of security funding many years back when the first, that was first discussed as security. There may well have been money available, and that was a discussion at the informal uh, work project groups, there may well be funding available that would, make, it would be allowed to be used with match funding, um, as we do all over the city uh, in terms of projects that you will get developers and the council, and with planning in particular, but also they will work with you. So there was all of that discussion and then there was then no money forthcoming. So, so I don't know if that's answering your question or not, but there was that liaison, but 
And because I think they saw themselves as being within there and we saw ourselves as being out there, how do we make that situation better? I don't have an, an answer for that, but I think that liaison just didn't work properly. And you could say there's faults on both sides. Does that answer you or not? Um, uh, I'm, I'm struggling to, 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 to you know, process all the information that you've, that you've given me. I'm sure my colleagues will confirm that my brain doesn't always work as fast as I would like it to work. Um, did they or did they not consult you uh, or, 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 or inform you of their intentions, design intentions, early enough in the process for you to be able to then um, design the complementary work that you're responsible for and fit that into the process. Yeah, and that was part of that project group working together b with what they were proposing and obviously some of the things they were proposing would have an effect in terms of you know, ramps to go in, um, temporary ramps to go in to facilitate the work, etc. Um, so therefore there was that liaison, but the difficulty was is that, I, uh, that, that that changed in terms of the security issues and that changed and then decisions seemed to change particularly about the vehicle access. You asked about the air quality, yes that is one of the issues that they, they believed was the issue about air quality and that was why they wanted to have vehicles as you're probably aware you could come in and out. Yep. So air quality was another issue but yep. security was the one um, that they basically you know did kind of change the situation. So yep. The situation kept changing. Yep. I think that's a yes, actually. Thank you very <laughs> much. Um, and if I could just um, move on, uh, um, just a wee bit of clarification on the permitted uh, development rights. Am I correct, and it's perhaps uh, maybe a question for Mr Gillatley, um, am I correct in, in my understanding of this is that Network Rail have permitted development rights and that therefore does not you, you exempt them from the normal planning application at which ancillary matters would be considered by the local planning authority? Or am I misunderstanding this? No, I do, good, uh, but, uh, my under, but I understand for Waverley there was one um, permission they had to get, I think, which was the roof and because of the height of the roof, etc. So I think they had to get that. But for everything else, but you maybe, you're probably more of an expert mm -hmm. than I am. No. I'm more of a transport professional and land use planning. But I think it seems to be more on heritage conservation issues that the rail industry has to consult with planning authorities rather than run of the mill, I'm going to change this office into a, an information centre. So there is, very, there is a limited amount of integration with the planning system as compared to an ordinary development. Am I correct, therefore, in, in, in suggesting then that if, if, it, if they didn't have this permitted development right, they would then be forced to consult, make a full planning application, uh, uh, you, you know, in the course of which transport and all the ancillary arrangements and so on and all the implications of the overall development could be fully and properly considered and that the permitted development rights actively mitigate against that process taking place. Uh, am I correct? Yes, understand yes. I think if they were building a brand new station, that was a new. It would be a different matter. Of course, we would be going through a very detailed process with them, as we would a new retail or education or commercial development. But when it's refurbishing and redeveloping an existing facility, there's there's a, a much more limited interaction with the planning system, and that's we were touching on the point that beyond the red line that I've seen referred to and mentioned today is the problem that ordinarily we would be expecting public realm improvements around the station or a new bus shelter, simple as that, you know, that sort of thing quite often is not considered we are only investing within the rail grounds over to you, public authority, to deal with the issues beyond that. And could you just briefly tell me, is that a result of changes in the planning system? Is this a new, new or is it something that's always been there within the planning uh, system? Uh, again, limitations of my planning knowledge, but I would say nothing has changed in my working life. Okay, thank you. And just it's, also, it's also the same at the Edinburgh Airport as well. There are certain parts that basically they don't have to go through the same process in terms of planning permission. They've got permitted rights. Uh, I'm not sure out with, but I'm, I know the airport because yeah. we've had issues about access to the airport in the past uh, and Waverley Station. And ports are the same as well. They have simil similar sure. rights. Yeah, that, that, that's actually very helpful. Um, and finally, just moving on to Haymarket, the committee have heard um, a number of concerns about 
narrow pavements, poor location of taxi ranks. And I appreciate, Councillor Hines, that you've talked about this before. Limited cycle parking, um, you know, the danger from tram lines, and I appreciate that issue may be sub judice, so you may not be able to say much about the specifics of that. Um, but are you, you know, are, are the council doing uh, what it can, or is it doing nothing to address the concerns and improve walking, cycling infrastructure in that area? Um, and again, maybe you could just to clarify it, um, uh, explain if, why these improvements weren't made, you know, as part of the tram project. Um, well, there obviously um, there was again lines for the tram project, so there was improvements in terms of integration between the tram, bus, and rail at Haymarket. Um, the issue um, regarding bike um, um, racks in, um, in the uh, Haymarket station, we've applied for funding and been successful in funding, um, so there will be extra uh, masses of extra um, bike racks going in there. But the question is, why wasn't that done at the place? And I don't mean to come, but if we go back to the same issues, Waverley, is they had permitted rights as well, and therefore the issue surrounding the station at Haymarket then was similar to Waverley. Um, the ones that we are taking is that we are looking, well, I see the bike racks and improvements there. We're looking at the issue um, of trade waste um, where we've got a particular problem. If you look at some of the photographs that were sent round, we were taking trade waste off the streets and that's part of our programme that we're um, rolling out throughout the city. We've had some pilot projects in Haymarket because, I say, if you look at some of the photographs about street clutter, trade waste, large trade waste bins, so getting them off. So we are taking action in terms of that. We also are looking at um, a, a study which we're spending quite a large resource on about the link between Roseburn and, in, and through the city centre centre and we are looking at that links particularly for cycle routes um, from Leith um, all the way through the city centre and out to Roseburn and that's what we're looking for in terms of a segregated cycling um, and cycling routes all through the city centre so that is part of that and the issue of um, widening of pavements there's some restrictions in terms of that but improvements was part of the bid that we put in for the stations fund and I'd love if we had the money um, and we have increased our money in terms of roads and pavements um, in the city uh, and we've kind of prioritised particularly Waverley Bridge and, and uh, Market Street but we'd like to look at improvements and we have plans that we put in as part of the station fund um, to improve round Haymarket as well and also the link, um, the bridge link that would take you over to Dal Rai as well, which would be helpful for pedestrians um, and for cyclists, because it, the, the growth in passenger numbers at Haymarket is just going to grow and grow and grow, because it is popular, because it does have a link in terms of um, taxis, um, cycles, walking, rail, tram, all of that. So yes, it's on, our, it's on our list to be able to do once we've got funding, and we do have plans for that. Just one bit of slight clarification, though I'm, I'm still not quite sure um, as to why these things weren't done at a much earlier date. And I appreciate you're doing a lot now, that's terrific, but why weren't they done at an earlier date? But because of resources and because of money, and perhaps if we didn't have permitted development, then that would have been part of the planning application for okay. Haymarket okay. for Section 75. Right. To, always looking for more resources to be able to spend. Indeed. Thank you very much. Okay. That's been very helpful. And it's back to the convener. I've exhausted no. my questions. Well, uh, uh, in view of your earlier comment about your brain, I'm not qualified to comment on that, but I think you were being unduly modest given the quality of your questions, Mr. McKenzie. We'll move on to Alec Johnston. Thank you very much, convener. Uh, I wanted to go on to the subject of Dundee Station and uh, with the waterfront development there, a unique opportunity at surface level at least to start with a blank slate. Uh, many respond respondents to our survey, however, have uh, asked that the, in relation to bus services, uh, they wanted them to call directly at the railway station. Now, your written submission mentions, uh, and I quote, uh, a bus hub, a short stroll from the station. Can you explain how you intend to uh, operate that and how it could be improved? Okay, thank you, Mr. Johnson. Um, bus operations in the city of Dundee are, are almost exclusively commercially operated by the bus mm -hmm. companies. They follow the routes where the passengers wish to go. Um, we have a small amount of public subsidy goes into socially necessary services, but the majority are provided by Nash Express Dundee and Stagecoach Limited companies. Um, the waterfront is just appearing now. The streetscape is now appearing in the central area of Dundee, and um, the attractions will be built over the coming years: offices, shops, the V&A museum, 
and, and, and a series of attractions, and we would expect bus services to start to migrate into that central waterfront area. However, uh, at this moment in time, the city centre public transport hub is a, a described a short stroll away across the market gate into what's called Whitehall Street, High Street, Crichton Street and Union Street, where almost all bus services in the city and the services going beyond the city call, and uh, that is a signed and safe walking route. And that uh, we put in a lot of money through public transport fund over the past decade to make that an attractive environment. So, bus services will not be directly operating at the station from the day it's opened, unless there's a major change in bus policy by the operators. There will be some services passing through, but uh, ordinarily we would expect passengers to walk across to the, the, bus, the bus hub in the city, existing city centre and we will have travel information in the rail station telling people when and where their buses are departing from and additional on-street signage to find their route there. Mm -hmm. So that is our strategy. Yeah. Uh, currently, or, or in the previous uh, system, it was a short walk, but it was often a complicated walk with a lot of pedestrian crossings and that sort of thing. Respondents to our survey are keen to see better pedestrian and cycle links between the railway station and the city centre. Uh, is there anything that can be done to improve that? Um, yes. Um, we, we have designed in the walking routes from the outset. So what you see emerging now will be an almost direct walking route. Um, of course, there's buildings in the way and you have decision points where you're unsure, am I turning left, going straight? Mm -hmm. And we're going to ensure that there is an on-street static old-fashioned sign telling you a map right, left for bus stops to shops to ensure pe uh, pedestrians are reassured of the route and including on that a street map of the surrounding area. So we have got a plan. We undertook an audit. Uh, it was a geographic information system which looked at decision points and we've uh, mapped out about 40 to 50 positions in Dundee city centre where on-street information will keep you on the right track to your destination. You indicated in your written evidence that there's currently no provision uh, being made to upgrade the rail side platform and waiting areas at the station. Uh, can you tell us why the this is the case and whether such an improvement is likely to come forward in the near future? Um, we're very keen to see the track side, the, the platforms improved. At this moment, Network Rail are unable to prioritise their funding to that, that station level enhancements. So our strategy has been to create a very nice and welcoming interchange at street level with all the facilities you would need when you arrive at the station, shops, retail cafes, travel information and you'll then travel down by escalator or, or elevator to the platform um, so that you can remain in a nice pleasant environment until you have to travel on the train. We are encouraging Abellio, the new East Coast operator Virgin, we're also encouraging the new sleeper operator um, to invest an element of their stations improvements in Dundee as we move forward. We have asked Network Rail to consider this. They are unable to at this moment. They feel the station was refurbished approximately 10 years ago in terms of reglazing of the roof, painting and CCTV, but it won't receive the, the full gloss effect that we'll have up at street level where the main station buildings will be. Basically, well, the, the, there is perhaps limitations uh, to what's available at platform level. There's going to be significant improvements in what's available at uh, the upper level. Yes, there will be an interface. This, as, a, as opposed to, as described in Edinburgh, interface will be a nice street level facility mm -hmm. with a fairly ordinary at track side level. It will be usable, safe and um, operationally sound, but it may not have the, the same um, impact that the upstairs will have. So upstairs will be a very high standard and has been designed with the rail industry on board at our cost. It's certainly a difference from the previous arrangements, which seem to just have a kiosk on the surface. <laughs> yes, absolutely. The passenger expectation is a little bit higher than just single, a single kiosk. Yes. yes. Thank you very much indeed. James. Thank you. Uh, i just got a couple of questions for Mr. Carroll. Yeah, your written evidence states that the redevelopment of Queen Street Station is a challenging environment in which to work with stakeholders. You've already touched on this. Can you explain why this is the case and what could be done to make the situation easier? Yeah, I think the, the, as I mentioned earlier on, you've got Buchanan Galleries, shopping centre getting redone, Glasgow Queen Street Station getting redone, 
Buchanan Street subway station getting redone and you'll be aware of the travelator between the, the, the main station, the Queen Street station and Buchanan Street and all the other works that are going on for the, the work we're doing with Glasgow City Council and Fastlink and, and what's happening with buses in the city centre. So in amongst all of that it has proved I think particularly challenging to ensure a coordinated integrated approach and I mentioned earlier about the Glasgow Queen Street Passenger Forum which we've used, um, created at SPT's behest to try and ensure that um, from a programme point of view and an end product delivery point of view that people were coordinated. In terms of the planning process, I think we've got different experiences. That if I can just focus on Queen Street Station, um, obviously the, the network rail were taking that through the transport and works process and then there was the, the, the car park in North Hanover Street um, which was the land disposal and they had to, to contact the office of the rail regulator about that. So already quite a complicated process um, consulting on, on, on two different things, uh, two different processes. Um, I, I empathise actually with net, Network Rail because that was two separate things going on in one place uh, cheek by jowl next to each other. Not, difficult for, not easy for organisations like ourselves to be able to deal with that. We found that the, the TOS process, transport and work process, um, was good. Network Rail were well, very much willing to engage and they did a lot of engagement with, with passengers. However, we felt the information that was provided in terms of leaflets that went out, consultation, um, was, was, was fairly poor um, and we, we sought more information from them. We didn't think there was enough information there for people to make an informed response, uh, but we had good dialogue with them and we've worked, I think, reasonably well with them trying to get improvements made um, within the station in terms of external to the station as far as that goes, again, we've, we've talked to uh, ad nauseum this morning about the red line and that has proved a challenge. Uh, we had good dialogue with them on that, but very much it was a case of what happens outside that red line is Glasgow City Council, SPT, whoever else's responsibility. And that has created a challenge for us in being able to deal with that and, and looking after the, 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 the buses. Um, you'll be aware outside Queen Street Station is one of the main, uh, there's three stops, uh, not just the, the Glasgow Airport bus comes in there, so you've got people arriving in Glasgow and getting out at the, uh, the, the corner of uh, um, West George Street and Dundas Street but you've got the main bus stops going down to the east end of Glasgow, so very uh, popular bus stops, over 100 buses an hour uh, at peak times going through those bus stops. So we wanted to make sure that that was integrated, and obviously that leads to further costs, perhaps for us, perhaps for the council. So I think it has been challenging. It is a very constrained space, um, but we've always taken the view that this is really a once-in-a-generation opportunity to try and, and get it right, to maximise the integration between uh, the rail station and the subway and the bus network and uh, the cycle network, which is a huge opportunity there. Uh, we want to make sure that we, 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 we get the, the station itself correct, that Buchanan Galleries is um, done in the right manner to maximise the benefit for uh, the city of Glasgow and the wider region, that being one of the main national rail stations. So it has been challenging. We had to put quite a lot of resource into that. It has been at times quite confusing. Um, but at least uh, I think we've, we've managed to get there with some um, uh, benefits, I think, for the, the, the passenger um, towards the, the, the process that we're going through just now. Still a few things to be sorted out in terms of uh, cycling, for example, and others. But um, the engagement process we've got with Network Rail and others involved in the, the variety of projects at the moment is good. And we are taking a positive approach to that to try and, as I say, get the maximised benefit for, for all of us. Thanks for that, my, my colleague. Uh, if he's going to ask you some more questions later on about uh, integration but can I ask you again I suppose it takes us back to the question that, that Mike asked about uh, these discussions you were having with Network Rail did that allow you early enough in the process even although they weren't willing to cross that imaginary electric red line uh, did that allow you to at least take into consideration what has to be done from the council SBT and all the other partners and what about the discussions with uh, the Buchanan galleries people how did that, how did that go uh, I think, um, again, just really treating the two of those, two, two of those separately at the, at the moment, in terms of network rail, um, we always like to get as much early notification as possible. I think, you know, um, with the greatest respect to ourselves and the councils, the earlier a council, the earlier SPT or an RTP knows about something, the more that we can plan ahead. That's just the way uh, these things go. Um, as I said, I think the information that was coming out about Glasgow Queen Street Station redevelopment specifically um, wasn't perhaps as detailed as we'd have liked. I think the passengers 
would have expected to see something taking an integrated approach, but the consultation that was undertaken by Network Rail was very much focused on how the station would look. Um, it didn't really talk about the wider, and did very vaguely talked about the wider integration, and I think that was part of the problem. So we've now got a good process. I think it, it probably could have been earlier, but it always could depend on the, the project. In terms of Buchanan Galleries, obviously they're a, a commercial organisation. We've been aware of their aspirations uh, to extend Buchanan Galleries for some time. We've had good dialogue with them over uh, the last few years on their, their plans for expansion uh, and they've gone through the planning process and they appear to have been willing to, to change their plans as, as, as necessary. Uh, there was a specific issue in relation to the travelator and that was sorted out uh, eventually once um, all parties had agreed on the most appropriate uh, kind of governance arrangements for that uh, and that's, that's really been sorted out I think. But again, you know, early dialogue with any developer is always welcome for, for an organisation like us or indeed the council. Okay. The, your written evidence also states that SPT took the unprecedented step of contacting the Office of Rail Regulation to maintain access to a section of the redeveloped Queen Street station. Can you explain why this action was necessary and what impact correspondence yeah, with the ORR had? Yeah, yeah, this really comes back to, again, the kind of roles and responsibilities in the, the different processes. Um, this is to do with the North Hanover Street car park, where they were disposing of that, and they had to get permission from the Office of the Rail Regulator, the ORR. Uh, they contacted us, consulted with us. Uh, we had a number of different concerns there in terms of pick-up, drop-off, blue badge parking, taxis, etc. And... Um, Network, we responded to Network Rail. Network Rail then represented our view to the ORR. We didn't feel perhaps that that was as strong as we would have liked. Um, so we wrote to the ORR just to point out these uh, points to them again, basically what we'd said to Network Rail. And the ORR, of course, uh, got back to Network Rail and said, no, these are, these are valid points. And now, as far as I'm aware, uh, the, the, the issues are being resolved in terms of the, the access level between the, the car park and the concourse, the same level access at the, the, the new station. Uh, there will be facilities for taxis, pick-up, drop-off, which we view as a win for us. Uh, perhaps not ideal the process that we had to go through to get there, but we got a good result in the end. But, you know, we've already heard about Network Rail, Scott Rail, etc. And now the ORR are another organisation that's involved in the, 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 the transport industry and just part of that perhaps complication that clarification that's needed on uh, uh, rules and responsibilities. Is there a, uh, a possible shortcut then to this? I mean, where you can contact ORR if you've got these concerns as opposed to going through Network Rail who dilute the message that you want to send and then you have to go through the process again? I, I, think that, I think there's anything that can speed the process up, anything that can make the process more transparent and more helpful, I think we'd, we'd most certainly support. Um, the ORR have specific responsibilities, Network Rail has specific responsibilities, and we've already talked about the kind of security aspects. The number one thing in running any transport system is obviously safety, security, and that can often lead to challenges, as we've heard earlier from the, the other speakers. I think that if it was possible to try and improve that process, um, we'd, we'd most certainly support it. Um, I think it's, it's probably not ideal, the process we've had to go through to get that result, but we got the result in the end, and that's the, the, the most important thing. It comes back to what I was saying earlier. Each of these projects is different. If there had been one process in place for the redevelopment of Queen Street Station and the disposal of land at North Hanover Street, it perhaps could have been taken... You know, taking part of that, they were two separate processes, two separate consultations, um, and that perhaps wasn't ideal when you're looking at, as I say, a once in a generation change to one, one of Scotland's main rail stations. I'm just going to touch on the integration and then pass you over to my colleague. You, you highlight that there's further scope to improve integration between modes at the redeveloped Queen Street station. What needs to be done to realise these improvements, and who will you have to work with to achieve them? Well, the, the, we're looking at doing these through the Queen Street Passenger Forum in terms of the coordination of that. Uh, we'll obviously be relying on the council. In, t in terms of the modes, I think there could be improvements to how cycle, the cycle network's integrated, cycle parking's integrated with the new station. Uh, there's still some issues to be bottomed out. Uh, the detail of the taxis and the pick-up drop-off points. Um, we've always wanted to maximise the integration between the subway and the, 
the, the Queen Street station via the Travelator and there is discussion and dialogue going on between our project managers uh, at SPT and at Network Rail to see how we can do that. That's most certainly something that um, is very much in the passenger's interest. That's one of the most popular entrances into Buchanan Street subway. So I think there's, there's quite a lot to be done there. We'll be require working with the Council, with Network Rail, uh, with probably with Transport Scotland, all the parties involved in the Queen Street Passenger uh, Forum Group and then various other delivery bodies. We will be, we're in constant dialogue with bus operators, you'll be aware, in the west of Scotland we've got over 70 bus operators. Um, we used to have around about 130, it's gone down over the last few years, so we need to be uh, quick to work with them. They provide round about 93% of, of services in the Strathclyde area, although we support somewhere in the region of 7% uh, uh, of those services. So we will need to work with them to look at how uh, the bus services, the, the best arrangement for bus services outside the station. That's again working with the operators, working with the council. So still a lot to be done. Uh, a lot of organisations that we need to work with and I suppose now that we're moving into uh, the kind of delivery phase that's something that we'll most certainly be putting resource into and, and getting on with. Okay, thank you very much. Thanks, Regina. Really? And just following on from the questions that James Jordan was asking, specifically in relation to integration of um, bus and rail services, we had over 450 responses to the survey, particularly about Glasgow Central. And one of the concerns that was raised by a number of those respondents was the lack of integration between bus and rail services, at particularly Glasgow Central. Um, they raised concerns about a lack of real-time bus information, um, and, and also signage in the station directing people where to get buses and, and trains and how to, how to connect um, to the different railway stations. Do you have any plans to tackle that? Um, because if, if you think about coming off a train at Glasgow Central, there is nothing there to tell you where to go to get a bus and where that bus takes you. Um, and as you walk right out of Glasgow Central Station, if, if I'm, memory serves me correct, and James, you might know this better than me, or you might remember, there's only a very small sign to tell you the walking route to, to, to Glasgow Queen Street Station. So there is very, very little in, in, in the way of signage or bus information at Glasgow Central. If, if you'll uh, permit me, I'll talk about other stations just to give examples and then come back to the example of Central Station. At Queen Street Station, uh, the redevelopment, that's, that's something that we feel we very much got a win on through the, the TOS process was ensuring there was adequate signage for the subway for the bus network and I think you'll see an improvement, a step change at, the, at Queen Street Station when it's done in terms of directions to cycling. Um, one of the things that we got across in our consultation response was that while a lot of people who use Queen Street Station or indeed any other station are regular users of that station, there is obviously a lot of tourists come into Queen Street, come into Central Station who aren't familiar with it, so you do need that, that signage put in place. I'll move on to, to Partick now, where that was a project uh, that, that, that we took forward, uh, integrating uh, rail, subway and bus. It's the only one in, in, in Scotland. Um, and that was something, again, we made sure there's good signage in there, uh, not only for, for other modes, but also for things like the Riverside Museum, etc. And now, uh, uh, a stay in Partick and it's also got the signage up for how to get to the new South Glasgow Hospital so we can do things uh, live and make sure that that's there um, with regard to Central Station it's long been an aspiration of SPT to improve the integration with bus, the bus network you have on Union Street just right next to Central Station a de facto bus station. Uh, hundreds of buses an hour going through there, the three stops. Not ideal uh, and we are continuing to work with Glasgow City Council to see what we can do about that. With regards to the integration, absolutely if there's something that can be done uh, with net that's a net central station is a network rail managed station. Again, very much something that we would like to, to see improved. Um, and again, we're, we're working with them. You'll be aware Glasgow City Council recently came out with their city centre transport strategy, um, looking to improve that. We've been working on Fastlink. A key element of that is access around the city centre, rationalising um, how the bus services go through the city centre, where they can stop. Union Street, making improvements in Union Street and the integration with the biggest station in Scotland uh, is, is obviously a key priority for us and will be not just us working with Glasgow City Council and Union Street, but I think most certainly something that we need to work with Network Rail on because I agree with you, at the moment it isn't ideal. 
So network rail are responsible for all the signage within the station. Um, so what, what, di excuse me, what dialogue have you had to try and persuade them? Are, are they not open to including additional signage or, or information in the station? Well, I, I, as far as I'm aware, uh, I, I, I wouldn't be able to comment on that, but it's most certainly something we'll take away today and I can find out and get back to the committee on what dialogue we have had. I know the, pri sorry, the priority for us has been working with the council to get Union Street to get agreement on what we can do there for the bus network and we'll, we'll most certainly look at what we can do with the integration with Central Station. So again, I'll perhaps respond to the clerk of the, 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 the committee to clarify what we've done about uh, contacting Network Rail about that. It would be useful for, for us to know the, the, the background of what you've tried to do so that we, we can put those questions to, to Network Rail when, when they, they come to committee because there's certainly plenty of scope within Central Station for, for additional signage. Um, whether it's on the main concourse or in the large ticket office that they have as you come out of, of Central Station, there is ample room so the, the background to what you've done would be helpful. Many respondents also raise concerns about the pedestrian environment, specifically around Glasgow Central Station, the clutter, the congestion, um, the time it takes to cross roads, difficulty um, in, in, in accessing um, other modes of, of transport. What has been done to try and alleviate those problems? Well, I think that's probably a question best answered by Glasgow City Council, but um, I think just at a strategic level, we'd say, you know, it is. Uh, Central Station is actually a really great station. It's one of the, the best in the UK, in my view, in terms of its, uh, its the scale of it and the way it generally it operates. They made some improvements about five or six years ago to the way the station improves, and I think that's worked reasonably well. Um, outside the station, again, it's perhaps perhaps a victim of this um, red line boundary which is coming up continually this morning. And uh, again, I, I know that Council, uh, in, in partnership with, with, with others, will be looking at how they can improve that. But again, that's probably a question best, served, best answered by Glasgow City Council. I do know that we've, um, we've, we've worked with Abellio, for example, and others over the years, or first as it was uh, previously, on the interstation bus, uh, you know, the connection between Queen Street Central and, and Buchanan Street. That's something that we've always had a big aspiration to improve and we think it could indeed uh, be improved even further now. Um, but yeah, the, the, the pedestrian environment isn't ideal, but it is a very cramped site, uh, very constrained. Uh, you've got as I've said, uh, Union Street on one side and many other buildings and, and busy streets on others. In Gordon Street, you've got the, the, the kind of one of the most popular taxi ranks in, in, in Glasgow. And so it's quite constrained around there. But when you do come out the station, it isn't particularly welcoming. And I know that's something that, that, that the council and, and others like ourselves have an aspiration to improve. But as I say, probably best answered by Glasgow City that's, Council. That's that. helpful. And my final question is around the connections between Glasgow Central and, and, and Queen Street. And if you could talk around the, the bus link first, and then we can talk about the cycle connections and, and the walking um, route. Because when you come out of Central Station, particularly if it is very busy, I, I use the station all, all the time. And on more than one occasion, I have seen pedestrians almost knocked down by the connecting bus coming in. Because people, a lot of people don't know, if you're a stranger to the city, you don't know the bus is coming in there. Um, it's very congested. Um, Again, within the station, and I take your point that it's network rail, within the station there's not a huge amount of signage to say that the connecting bus to Queen Street Station leaves outside. There's nothing really outside to say this is where the bus is, this is when it comes in. Um, so what's been done to improve that link between the two stations, particularly by the bus? Yeah, I mean, it's the, 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 what was previously called the 398 service. Um, it, it is specified by Transport Scotland in the franchise. Um, Abellio have committed to, to continue that. We did have some dialogue with, uh, uh, with Abellio to look at getting a, an electric bus put on that route because it is uh, quite a visible bus in the city centre. Uh, and particularly if it's um, pumping out emissions, then people do notice that because of its profile. Um, that's something that they, they, they didn't want to take forward. But again, something we're more than happy to engage in dialogue with them. I don't think... <coughs> 
the current way the bus operates is is ideal. Um, I think you're you're absolutely right in terms of coming out the station. It perhaps isn't clear, uh, and if there's any safety issue again, that would be something that, that you would you need to question network rail on. Uh, I know at Queen Street Station where it is at the moment, um, it's perhaps not the most ideal, but it is just straight off the concourse and the the, the interstation bus is there. Perhaps not as obvious as it as it could be. Um, it is reasonably well used, um, but it's a vital service for people who have difficulty walking etc but again very much could be improved and we'd be delighted to, to discuss with Transport Scotland Network Rail and Abellio how best to do that but again probably a question for, for, for Network Rail and those others in the rail industry yeah. how best to do that and the walking distance between the, the two stations um, five minutes I, I can do it in, in five minutes um, it's a, a fairly short route but it's quite a, a, a complicated route to to, especially to tell someone that doesn't know the city. So that clearly there's improvements that could be made to the walking route and also the cycling route. So who would be responsible for them? Would it be the city council? Or? It would be the city council, but again, that's something we've uh, we've been working closely with Glasgow City Council on improving the cycle network across the west of Scotland over the last few years. We've inv invested millions of pounds in it. Uh, again, not ideal. If it's a day like today, it's a lovely walk. Um, if it's not a day like today, which unfortunately in Glasgow it regularly is, uh, it's a bit of a, a bit of a pain. You need to follow the Z along Gordon Street, Buchanan Street, then on to, to West George Street. Um, I do know the council have, on West George Street, you, you might be aware, just as it comes, comes up to Dundas Street, they've widened the pavement there. That makes things a wee bit easier. It is still particularly uh, busy. But, yeah, uh, something we'd be delighted to talk with the uh, Glasgow City Council about, about improving the, the cycle links between uh, the two stations. I do know it's something that Abellio, in their new role as the franchise holder, are very keen to lift the standard of, of, of cycling integration with rail and again perhaps something um, uh, we could talk to Abelio uh, about but yeah anything like that could most certainly be improved. Uh, you've got the two major stations as you say uh, within five minutes of each other so it's only right that the, the signage, the linkage by pedestrians and, and, and by cyclists is, is improved there. Yeah, because it could be something as, as simple, particularly for the walking route, is providing some sort of small map with um, a kind of basic, this, this is Glasgow Central and you are here, and, and showing you the route. And if that was available in both stations, that, that would certainly make it much, much easier. But again, that would be something for, for yeah. Network Rail to look at. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, I think there is uh, signage and, and maps available within Central Station. It's perhaps just making the visibility of those a bit better, yeah. which is always the, always the issue. OK, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, do members have any further questions for our witnesses this morning? No. In that case, can I just bring our um, session to a close by asking each of the witnesses if there is a particular... Um, take home message which they would want to leave with the committee. I'm conscious that one of the, the, the themes uh, across the range of evidence sessions that we've had is this need for what you might call the three C's collaboration, coordination and consultation and in different ways each of the witnesses in, their, in our different sessions have highlighted those but I just wondered if you had a take home message for the committee yeah, we'll, we'll go this, we'll go this way shall we yeah I think um, you know the the number of organisations that have been mentioned round the table this morning. I think perhaps says its own message that the integration and coordination are the most important thing. I've talked about the Glasgow Queen Street Passenger Forum, which has been a positive step forward. Uh, one thing I'd like to highlight to the committee is uh, SPT is a regional transport partnership. Identifying the issues that went on with Glasgow Queen Street and other things that have gone on, I've recently written out to the various partners in the transport industry to establish what we're calling the West of Scotland Transport Integration Forum, specifically to look at high-level strategic what are you doing? When are you doing it? What's the stage of the process that you're at to try and uh, bring together uh, and facilitate better coordination? Um, we're relying on the goodwill of organisations to be involved in that. We've had a positive uh, response so far. Interestingly, uh, I think the first response we got was from the CPT, uh, so the bus operators very keen to be involved in that. They're obviously commercial organisations, and we're, we welcome that. I think that's the kind of a, uh, step forward we'd like to see. Uh, and I think the, the important point that I'd leave for you is organisations like SPT, the Regional Transport Partnership, where we do have statutory responsibilities, we do have a multimodal remit, 
uh, we'd be delighted to take a stronger uh, uh, role in organising and integrating and coordinating major uh, transport projects to provide a, a, a one-stop shop for, for that, kind of, uh, that kind of work and we'd be delighted to, to talk with yourselves and, and others in Transport Scotland about how we could take that forward. Yeah, and, and not just a number of points, just to summarise, I mean, first and foremost, it needs to be passengers at the heart of, of, of what we're trying to do here. Um, and it's sometimes, it's, it's been said this morning, it's not about people on stations that you know, and you, you know how to get to one place to another, and you know the set out. It's for people who don't know, and people with disabilities, and people with diff difficult access. I think so. Passengers seems to be has to be at the heart of any kind of decision making process we take, and also linked into that is the int integration, you know, of all modes. Um, we need to get far better at, and about how we do that. Uh, we don't have the. Um, we're not lucky enough to have a transport authority um, like um, Strathclyde and Glasgow has. Um, I would like that, um, and that might be in the future. Hopefully, it might be considered. But well, we have got a Transport for Edinburgh um, board, which I, I chair, which brings together particularly tram and bus. Um, because unlike Glasgow, we have a Lothian buses service. It's the majority of the bus services um, that is provided in the city is publicly owned. Um, but again, that Transport for Edinburgh could see that kind of integration, how we progress that. We also have set up in the last year, because aware of it, is a, a kind of rail forum, bringing together all the rail operators and another one that brings together all the bus operators, and they've found that quite useful, and so have we, particularly talking about integration and, and how they work better together and how we work better together as a, a council with them. So that kind of um, conversations, but also working together and sitting around a table. But integration is, is the key, so that it's easy. We all go to European cities where we go from one mode of transport easy in terms of ticketing, but also from one mode of transport so much easier to the other. And that has to be the key of, uh, of particular rail stations, but how does it integrate? Uh, secondly, it's is, is just about network rail and about the open and accountability, I think, needs to be looked at, and that has been discussed. Um, thirdly, it's about permitted development and whether that's something that might be wished to be considered. Um, the station fund um, and how that works and how open and accountable that is and whether that could be used not just for rail only and who, de de who de designates what rail only is. And I'm sure all of us would welcome some resources to help with, um, out with um, the stations. Um, also, information is key. Um, and that's come out this morning as well in terms of not just signage, it's signage internally but also externally as well and I think you know, we as local authorities need to get better at that as well and, and also maps online, you know, not everybody's online but maps etc and information that you get before you get to the station as well. It's one of the things that we've discussed is that, you know, it's all very well when you get to the station and there's signposting, but actually before you get there, the information that's given to you, if you're coming from abroad or you're coming from London or wherever and you're coming into the rail station, you've got that information, how you can get the taxi, how you can get a bus, how you can get a tram, all of that. So getting that information, I don't think we're, we're good enough as well, but signage is pretty important um, and I think that needs to be looked at. So these were the, the kind of points that I hope that it's um, been brought out this morning. Okay, thank you. That, that's quite an extensive shopping list, Boris, so thank you for that. Mr Galatly, you have the final okay. word. Okay, um, um, I would say, I think you've heard there's a plethora of stakeholders. Um, we must make them feel that they're actively involved when we're planning and strategising for the future. They must be engaged. We must remember why the station is there. It gets a little bit too self-serving thinking about the operational and the, the facts and that, that boundary is not a glass roof or a glass wall. This all goes right back to our house on the bus when we've gone downtown. We must remember the, the, the joined up in this of our, our city lives. I'd also just finally want to say that rail travel, as I said it before, is a regional and a national issue. It's not always local and a, a helping hand at feasibility stage would be a lot more helpful than a um, a stop, too many stops where you can't do this. We just need a helping hand to break us through with our concepts and ideas because there's people all over the country wishing to take things forward and any help would be greatly help, greatly appreciated. Okay. Can I thank um, each of our witnesses for their comprehensive evidence this morning? It's been incredibly helpful uh, to the committee in taking forward this important uh, piece of work. And I now move this meeting into private session. Thank you.